My sister gave me a bottle of perfume for Christmas a couple of years ago. And I was so excited because I'd never really had perfume before. It's just something that I never purchased for myself. It always felt like a little bit of an unnecessary luxury, like I'd rather spend my money on something else, like brunch. So. This was a perfect gift, something my sister knew that I would enjoy but would never buy for myself, something with no utility, no real purpose, other than for me to enjoy and to feel special and loved. The perfume was from a Dutch company. My sister lives in the Netherlands, so a Dutch company that makes less expensive versions of popular scents. And it came in this sleek glass bottle that I put on my bathroom counter. I wanted it to be visible. It felt like a touch of elegance and something that, when I saw it every day, would remind me of my sister who lives so far away. My family was in Chicago that year for the holidays. It was the first time that Noah and I hosted Christmas in our home, which is a big deal. It was a big step for us. And we had a wonderful holiday, and then, of course, you know, a few days later, everyone dispersed. My parents started their drive back to Alabama. My sister got on a plane to the Netherlands and even Noah left to visit some other family. So left alone in the house, I began the necessary task of tidying up. I was going to be alone for a few days and I don't know about all of you, but when I have the house to myself, I like to get it clean and calm so I can just sit and read my book in peace. So I put on some Christmas music and I began to swiffer my way through the apartment. And it was a thorough cleaning. I was really going in on this one. I rearranged the leftovers in the fridge. I plumped the sofa pillows. I was even mopping the hard to get areas that if I'm honest, we sometimes ignore. And in my thoroughness, I knocked the bottle of perfume off the bathroom counter. Yeah. That elegant bottle shattered on the tile floor, sending shards of glass and droplets of perfume everywhere. And the scent of perfume was surrounding me as I began to cry. I know it's sort of a silly thing to cry about. A bottle of perfume, it's easily replaceable. But I cried nonetheless, tears of frustration and disappointment as I vacuumed up the gift I never even had a chance to use. A package arrived at my door the next day. Can you guess what was inside? It was a new bottle of perfume. In fact, it was the fancy one that the Dutch perfume was modeled after. My sister gave me this extravagant gift 
not just once, but twice. What do we make of extravagant gifts? What do we do when we receive them? And what do we do if or when we give them? Now let me say, nothing starts a conversation like an extravagant gift. Have you ever been to a birthday party where one person clearly spent 10 times more on their gift than everyone else? Or a fundraiser where someone pledges hundreds of thousands of dollars? Oh, it'll get a conversation going. It brings all of these emotions into the room. Excitement, gratitude, curiosity, maybe even a little jealousy or judgment. Mary gets the conversation going with her extravagant gift for Jesus in today's story. They are all at a dinner party filled with familiar faces. There's Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus, and at least one disciple, Judas Iscariot. And they come together for this dinner that's being given in honor of Jesus. And all of a sudden, Mary pulls out this jar of costly perfume a pound of pure nard, which costs almost a year's wages. And she gets down on her knees, and she tenderly pours the oil on Jesus' feet. And she takes her hair and uses it to massage the perfume into his skin. It is intimate. It is extravagant. It's maybe even a little bit uncomfortable for everyone else in the room. It's clearly uncomfortable for Judas, who says, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money used for the poor? Now, I don't like to give Judas credit, but it's a fair question. At face value, it's a fair question, right? It's reasonable and even good practice to think critically about how the church uses its money. Every church has to balance acts of worship, like money spent on flowers, <laughs> and acts of mission. Every church has to think about this. And it's reasonable to wonder about how institutions and how religious figures use their money. Now, the author of the text is quick to point out that Judas isn't actually concerned with the poor. The author says that Judas was a thief and he used to steal from the common purse. So maybe Judas isn't actually concerned with the money going to the poor and he's more concerned with money that he can't get his hands on because it's being poured out at the feet of Jesus. Then again, it is possible he's really just confused by this moment of extravagance. Either way, it is a fair question to ask. And either way, Jesus' response can be confusing, and it's caused a lot of confusion in the church. Jesus responds by saying, leave her alone. Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. There are a lot of Bible verses that have been misunderstood throughout Christian history. A lot of verses. Maybe that's a sermon series. This is one of them. So here's what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that poverty is inevitable, that poverty is unfixable, or that poverty is not worth our attention. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's quoting Deuteronomy 15:11, which says, for there will never cease to be needy ones in your land, which is why I command you Open your hand to the poor and the needy in your land. 
And if you read that verse in its larger context, you'll find it is part of God's commandments and instructions to the people on how to treat the poor. And these instructions include radical things like debt forgiveness and mutual aid. Do those sound familiar? They are just as relevant today as they were then. So Jesus is saying, Judas, Judas, my disciple, God commanded us to help the poor for as long as poverty exists. Aiding the poor will always be part of our work. But don't miss what Mary is doing here. Leave her alone. Leave this preacher alone. I went to a luncheon with Pastor Veronica and Minister Minnie on Thursday, hosted by an organization called Live Free Chicago. And they were celebrating women social justice preachers, or preach hers, as they like to say. At the luncheon, they honored Dr. Iva E. Carruthers and Reverend Dr. Jeanette Wilson. And when Reverend Dr. Wilson accepted her award for this amazing lifetime of social justice preaching, she said something that really stuck with me. She said, there are so many women who came before us who didn't get to call themselves preachers. Mary couldn't call herself a preacher. It wasn't appropriate then. It wasn't appropriate for a long time after that for women to call themselves preachers. But Mary is giving a beautiful sermon. No words, but a beautiful sermon at this dinner party. And Judas's question is so distracting that we might miss it. This text comes at a critical part of John's gospel. Allow me to give a little bit of a timeline here. A few chapters ago, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the same Lazarus who was here at the dinner party. And this action of Jesus, this miracle, is like the straw that broke the camel's back. The authorities become so threatened by Jesus' power so threatened by Jesus' love for the poor and works of healing and liberation that they decide to kill him. All of that comes right before today's story. And what comes after is equally important. The authorities decide that they should also kill Lazarus. It's not enough for them to kill the miracle worker. They have to kill the evidence of the miracle, too. And this takes us up to the entry into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, which we are going to celebrate next week. And remember, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is his entry into his final days. So today's text is bookmarked by death and its aftermath and resurrection. Death is at the dinner. And Mary recognizes it. And she gives a profound Lenten sermon through this act of worship. Lent is a time for many things, for self-examination, for spiritual practice, for works of service. It's also a time to talk about death and to grapple with our finitude. We began this period of time on Ash Wednesday by marking ourselves with the words, for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Lent reminds us that our earthly lives are so precious. They're so precious. And they will end. But they're not the end. When Mary anoints Jesus' feet, she demonstrates that she understands Jesus' teachings. Mary has spent a good bit of time at Jesus' feet, not only listening to him, but understanding him. Understanding him in a way that not everyone does. Many of his disciples at this point still do not comprehend what is going to happen 
They still don't get it, but Mary does. She knows what is going to happen. She knows that Jesus will die, so she anoints his feet to prepare him for burial. And all this happens in the presence of Lazarus. He doesn't say a word the entire time, at least not one that is recorded, but he is there. Use your spiritual imagination and wonder what that must have been like for him, for his sisters, for everyone. It creates a profound intersection. At the precipice of death, there's a reminder of resurrection. And Mary marks it. She orients us to this truth through an act of extravagant and prophetic worship. And in doing so, she shows us how we can approach the next two weeks and how we can approach death. We can approach death with tenderness and love. If the past two years have taught us anything, anything at all, it is that life is precious and that it is precarious. That we should not wait to fiercely love one another. We should not wait to extravagantly love one another, to anoint one another's feet and say, you matter to me. And we can approach death with the knowledge that it is not the final word. There is resurrection. There is life after this one. That is the whole principle of our faith. I don't know what exactly it looks like. I have some thoughts. But I know it exists. I've told this story before, but I want to tell it again this morning. As most of you know, both Noah and I lost grandparents this last summer. And they were really on our mind before our wedding celebration. And the night before our rehearsal dinner, some of us were there at the hotel early. And a small group gathered for dinner. We ordered pizzas, we opened some wine, and we dragged tables and chairs out onto this patio area. And we sat outside where I cannot stress enough how calm the evening was. Beautiful. No inclement weather. And all of a sudden, there was this rush of wind so strong that it began knocking plates and drinks off the tables. And then just as quickly as it came, the wind stopped. And we all turned to one another with wide eyes. And someone said aloud what we all were thinking. I think that was the grandparents. Death can be really scary and traumatic and so hard. But my friends, it is not the final word. The people we love continue through the power of resurrection. I know this because I've experienced it. I know this because Lazarus is at the table. I know this because Easter is coming. So resting in that knowledge, let's come to the table.